Welcome back, guys. Uh, we're unfortunately coming close to the end of Mobile Era, but we still have two exciting talks left. Uh, it's our privilege here to present Baldur, and he'll give us a talk. Uh, thank you. Cheers. Is everyone hearing me okay? Yeah? Excellent. Uh, thanks, everyone, for turning up. Uh, I see you brought your popcorn. Buckle up. This is going to be great. Uh, so, uh, my name, uh, it's Baldi Merk. I am uh, a technical domain expert at Fin.no, uh, and a TD for short. Uh, it's pretty much uh, the same as a tech lead at any other company. And I'm here to talk to you about our app, our Android app, and our, ex our experiences working with it. So, some of you might not be familiar with Fin.no. Uh, so I'll just give a short recap of uh, our company. It, it is Norway's by far largest classified ad site. Uh, practically anyone in Norway is familiar with Finn.no. If you want to buy a house, you want to buy a car, you want to sell your PlayStation, you'll probably do it using our uh, site. We have an uh, um, enormous brand recognition and also people like us, so that's that's nice. We've been offering apps for iOS and Android uh, since about 2012, and currently about 40% of our visitors use one of the native apps to access our services. We have um, um, an en engineering department with about uh, 120 developers, and currently around 10 of those are app developers, four Android devs, six iOS, iOS devs, and we also have to consultants helping, it, uh, helping us out on the Android side. So today, I want to talk to you about three main topics. I'll start off by giving you some history and background info about the app. Also talk about its basic architecture, how we make it. Then I'll proceed to talk about what we've learned making that app. Um, and also how the choices we made while originally building it, affect us today. Um, I'll end off by giving you a little taste of the direction we'll be taking with our app in the future, or at least where we hope or might try to take it. Does this sound okay? Excellent. So, by the way, uh, the cute little cat there, that's our uh, company mascot. His name is Pusifin. And uh, if you are familiar with Norwegian TV ads, you will also know Pusifin. Yes, we, I actually uh, went to his uh, party this summer along with all of my colleagues. Pusifin threw a garden party for the entire company. Very nice guy. <coughs> He's a cool cat. So, uh, about our app now. Uh, when we started out making apps at Finn, we wanted to figure out what, which of our currently available services or which actions are hardest to do using our web solution. Because for since about 2000, we've been offering a web version of Finn, and that's been our main entry point. And uh, inserting ads using mobile browsers around 2011, 2012, was, could be quite a chore. So we started out uh, making, uh, making an app for ad insertion, and that's the only thing it did. If you wanted to browse uh, Finn and find uh, objects for sale, you would have to, have to use the web version. But this could make it uh, simpler to uh, use uh, photos available in your phone's gallery and upload them and create an ad. And then, uh, about a year later, we introduced a separate app for searching and browsing uh, and for saving your favorites. Uh, and this had a quite neat feature where you could suddenly get notifications uh, when something matching your search turned up on our site. 
And that's uh, quite a big deal if you are looking for rare items that uh, only turn up every once in a, uh, in a while. And you could get instant notifications, push notifications on your device when something was available. We had these separate apps for a while, uh, but eventually, and maybe inevitably, we tried, we merged them into a single app. So, a slight visual makeover, and now we also introduced an uh, add new add feature to our app. Uh, this, also, this also marked the start of our modularization of the app, which I will get back to you a bit later. Uh, but suddenly we had sort of different sections of the app that had to work together. Moving on. The app's architecture, I'll just talk briefly about that. Uh, we do, we use an MVP pattern. And for those of you who are not familiar with that, it's basically about separation of concerns. So for every screen uh, in our app, there is the M is the model, the V is the view, and in our case, that's uh, uh, inheritor of an, uh, an Android view, so it's an Android custom view, and we have a presenter class. And that lets us do testing of our business logic, which is placed in the presenter class, without needing to invoke any Android platform specific classes. We use a single activity for the entire app. Might be unfamiliar uh, to some Android developers, while others have also started adopting this approach. So each screen that you see while using our app is a custom view. Um, we use something called Flow, which I'll get back to in a moment, for managing our navigation history. We use dependency injection uh, for managing the dependencies of the app. And apart from that, it's a pretty standard Android Studio project. Uh, so we use Gradle plugin, we use all the normal tools that you're used to. We have currently about 25 modules, a bit more. Uh, and to some, that's quite a bit. Uh, I was at a talk uh, at a DroidCon in London last week, where we were told about uh, the Spotify app that has around 600 modules, which is quite a bit. Uh, they talked about, uh, at one point, the resource, the R.java file they had, uh, had about 57 million lines of code in it. That's uh, unman unmanageable. It was larger than the rest of the project combined. So, the technology we use. We use Kotlin. Uh, are you guys familiar with Kotlin? Can I get a show of hands how many are using or have used Kotlin? Okay, so not everyone. Uh, if you are an Android developer currently working with uh, Java, I encourage you to try Kotlin. Uh, and convince your manager to let you use it. Uh, to us, we have experienced an uh, extreme decrease in uh, null pointer exceptions because Kotlin has explicit nullability, so the compiler will warn you, uh, or it will actually stop you from compiling code where um, property can be null unless you handle that nullability. It also works seamlessly with existing Java code, so you can start off by converting one of your classes to Kotlin and just take it from there. It also offers collection streams, uh, which you don't have in the standard Java on Android. And you can make extensions. So if you do a series of steps to a certain to objects of a certain class a lot across your code base, you can write an extension for that a single time, and you can do that for uh, classes in the uh, standard library. Uh, so you can do it both for your own classes and classes offered by libraries. So check out Kotlin. Uh, we strongly recommend it. Uh, we started using it around March 2017. And uh, as you can see, we're currently at around 30%, 37% of our code base is Kotlin versus Java. Uh, the way we do it is that whenever we write new functionality, we do it in Kotlin. If we are just touching 
old functionality, we usually leave it, but if there are some major changes, we usually convert a Java class into Kotlin. So we got that done. And if we have spare, spare time on our hands, we might do a conversion spree where we convert a whole set of uh, classes to Kotlin. <coughs> Uh, I mentioned our single activity approach where we use a library by Square called Flow. Now we have uh, modified and mistreated that uh, library so much that it is, it's still recognizable, but it is not the flow that Square made. Uh, we use it in uh, conjunction with Toothpick, which we actually started uh, experimenting with after a talk here at Mobile Era a couple of years ago. We use that for handling dependency injection. So uh, when we take our custom views uh, and they are inflated and we want to put them on the screen, we also do dependency injection. We create a scope for that screen and do the injection at the same time. So that's integrated into the dispatcher, which is the part of flow that is responsible for replacing the screen contents. We use retrofit with OKHTP for our network calls. And we use Jackson for uh, serializing and deserializing uh, JSON. So naturally, we use uh, JSON with, uh, with our REST APIs, but we also use JSON uh, with Flow. Because as you might know, uh, when an Android app goes into the background, it can be killed at any point, but you get a chance to save your state. And we serialize our entire navigation stack using Flow and Jackson, write it to disk so we can restore it when your app is relaunched. And you will hopefully be back where you left off without noticing that your app was ever killed. We also use RxJava quite heavily. Now, before the introduction of Kotlin, uh, this was one of the best ways to get collection streams with, uh, with older versions of Java, which Android is using. It uh, has the language features of uh, one Java 1.8, but you don't have the collection streams. It also offers uh, simple thread control. It is a reactive library, so we have to think a bit differently. It is based on a subscriber observer pattern. So you need to rearrange your code a bit. It could take some time to wrap your brain around if you haven't used it before. But we find it extremely powerful, extremely helpful. Although those of you who are familiar with Kotlin might have heard of Kotlin coroutines. And also Kotlin also offers collection streams. So a lot of the places where we are using RxJava today might be possible to uh, replace with coroutines and uh, Kotlin's own collection streams. But there are also cases where we are actually subscribing to a stream of events, and RxJava is a really excellent tool for that. So if you're not using it, investigate it, take a look. It could be useful. Now, about our server client architecture. Uh, Fin.no has a backend with around 500 microservices, and of course, these aren't all made for apps. A lot of them are uh, just for communicating between services. But some of them needs to be exposed for the app. And we use REST APIs for that. We are not using GraphQL or anything like that. The, these are often made for web use. So we have a couple of uh, intermediate servers. We have uh, backend for frontend that we refer to as the proxy, which does some work on uh, the services further behind. And we have a newer approach that is more of a pass-through approach, which I will get back to later. So that's a brief overview of the app, how it's composed, how we, how we make it and uh, what we make. And now let's mo move over to lessons learned because we have learned a few things. We have made mistakes and we have learned from them. And now you might benefit from some of that. <coughs> so uh, the re for, for most of the screens and interactions in our app, we need to compose data from several sources. Fin .no, fi at Fin, we work in feature teams. So we, we have teams that own that feature, the full stack. 
which can be a sort of a challenge sometimes because you might need features from several teams. Uh, we use a lot of different technologies. At Finn, we use the tool best suited to solve a problem. Uh, at least 11 programming languages from Haskell, Scala, Java, uh, React is used, uh, Python, and so on. So we need to find a way to unify this and present a simple API for the app. And we have two main approaches for that. Prepare to be dazzled. So <coughs> this is my uh, three-year-old uh, drawing of uh, what it looks like. The factory is, of course, where all the work is being done. And this is the old way that we refer to as the proxy. This is how we started out making the back end for front end for our app. Now, this uh, essentially puts a lot of the, lo the logic common to iOS and Android in a single code base. And um, it means that we don't have to replicate that. It uh, takes data from several sources. It creates a response that contains all the stuff the app needs and only the stuff the app needs and sends that in a single response uh, in a format that's suitable for the app. It also lets us uh, process the data and reformat if that's needed and so on. And since we use it for, uh, for uh, the page layout information, for, for example, for uh, ad pages, uh, we can experiment with the order of elements, uh, font sizes, and so on, without having to release a new app, at least for minor changes. Uh, of course, we can't think of any possible use or need, so we'll talk about that as well. Uh, and of course, loading a page, very simple. The app does request, it gets a response, renders it to screen. There's a challenge, of course. I talked about the feature teams. Uh, and the ownership of the proxy is now a problem. Because you have clear owners of the circles at the bottom, and the app developers deal with the app at the top. Who owns the proxy? Uh, is it the feature owners that are responsible all the way out into the app? Is it the Android devs or the iOS devs? I'm, of course, joking. iOS devs can't read or write Java, so they are useless in this case. Uh, and this is a challenge we need to solve. So, introducing the new way. We call it the gateway because proxy was already taken. It is, uh, in essence, it is a simple facade in front of our backend services. It exposes them with a single base uh, host name, uh, but it just adds authentication, does authorization, and just passes the request on to whatever is further behind. And now we have a solution to the ownership problem because the people responsible for service are now, uh, they are now able to expose it all the way up and out to the gateway and the app will handle it from there. Uh, it doing this, give, I mean, empowering the feature teams to own their service all the way out to the app also forces them to consider apps because we will no longer be doing that last step for them. Uh, and it has some other benefits when we uh, need to compose a screen with data from different sources. It might load a bit faster. It can load progressively. It couldn't uh, before. We would need to wait for every, uh, every service to return something. And if something broke, then maybe the entire response would break. Now we can just have parts of the page being broken. We don't want pop-in and resizing. If you have ever uh, used uh, a website where suddenly an ad appears under your finger just as you are pressing some interesting headline, you know why you don't want that. We don't want the content to bounce up and down the page while you're scrolling. Um, yes, the app now gets a bit more complex. We've moved the factory into our app because we need to do the data composition now. It means that we do need to uh, replicate logic in um, iOS and Android, but we think the advantages are worth it. 
uh, and using this architecture won't tempt us into making proxy 2 because we uh, the gateway is so dumb it can't do any of the clever processing we used to do before and now to give an example of how this data composition problem manifests itself i will talk about the object page format and the object page is our term for uh, the page representing the item being sold or offered. So this could be a job ad, it could be a car for sale or a house for sale or anything like that. Um, and the format of our response specifies the different elements that make up the page. And as I mentioned, we build it using data from several microservices. And you can see how these different sections on this page might come from completely different services. We have recommendations at the bottom. We might offer the user a loan so he can afford his shiny, slightly used car or house and so on. Now, an advantage to having this, uh, because this is a very presentation heavy format, uh, it contains all the styling needed and uh, it ensures same-ish layout, ideally the same uh, for iOS and Android. And it made it easy for us to experiment with the order of elements and how they are supposed to look and so on. And this was a big deal back when iOS, iOS apps could spend two weeks in review. Uh, it is not as important anymore. We can usually tweak these things with uh, minor app releases. Uh, but uh, it did make a lot of sense and it also simplified the logic in the apps. It has no semantic information at all, or at least hardly any. It is all styling and uh, the app knows very little about the actual contents of what it's representing. It's usually text laid out in a certain way. Uh, we have a limited set of cell types, so it, if you want to introduce something new, that could be uh, introduce problems with backwards compatibility and so on. So at a point we introduced a new type of cell, uh, which was a uh, which was able to display components. So we added a component uh, language that let us build richer experiences like this with expandable elements and so on. But we were still re-implementing HTML, except this time we were doing it inside of a worse re-implementation of HTML. Um, now, our solution for this is that we are moving towards a pure data format, or at least purer data format. We want to remove uh, the styling. Um, we want to use uh, custom views for the different sections of the page and let the app control how to present the data it receives from the server. And that means that we, if we want to change the visual appearance of page elements, we need to do a new app release, but we think it's worth it. And we think it lets us do a lot more exciting things with the stuff on our pages. Uh, it also lets us make uh, layout files, native uh, Android XML files, so we can preview what the pages will look like during uh, while, while designing on, on uh, in Android Studio. So we can uh, hang out with our designers and see this is what it will look like, sort of using sample data which was harder when we needed an actual server response to see what it would look like. To give an example of the problem we are addressing with this, uh, here is what uh, viewing could look like with the old format. So someone is selling their house and uh, as a user you want to see when can I come uh, see the real estate agent and take a look at the house. And this is all presentation, this is text in a table and uh, we specify which font type to use, uh, the alignment and so on. But if we want to do something clever to this in the app, uh, we want to add uh, functionality for putting this in your calendar or just present it in a new, more exciting way, 
We can't do that because the app has no way of knowing that this is actually viewing date information. So we do something a little bit more like this, which is uh, less human readable, more machine readable, but uh, it is also a lot more powerful. Uh, we, have, uh, we now have a viewings type which contains information relevant to viewings and we can start doing some more interesting stuff in the app with this. Uh, and although we are doing this change at the same time as we're introducing the shift from the proxy to the gateway, those two problems are not really connected but it makes sense to do them at the same time because making uh, these re requests to uh, to uh, data from that might come from a specific feature team. Uh, doing that at the same time as we are enforcing an architecture where services are uh, just passed through the gateway makes a whole lot of sense uh, to do at the same time. We could have tried doing this at the proxy, but then the temptation would eventually uh, arise to start doing the clever stuff again, and we would be back where we were. I talked about our single activity approach. Uh, and we started out making an app like anyone would make an Android app with uh, activities containing fragments. And we let Android handle the navigation stack of activities. So you learn, uh, one screen or one interaction is rep represented as an activity, which launch an activity on top of that and so on. Uh, and then a couple of years ago, we read uh, we read an article by Square, which if you are an Android developer, you must be using at least a couple of libraries developed there, where they introduced Flow uh, as their solution to this problem. Fragments at the time were buggy and leaky, and uh, it was all very complex with uh, the activity lifecycle, the fragment lifecycle, and so on. And this simplified things whole deal. Um, giving us this full control over the navigation stack because it is now essentially just a list of keys that represent the screen makes it possible for us to handle deep links and build entire navigation uh, paths and modify them if you want to uh, if you want you to if, if, if you are a few uh, screens in the view hierarchy and you want to back out, but we want to change your history, we can easily do that. So we have full control in a wholly different way. The way we do it uh, architecturally is that the M part of our MVP triplet is uh, both uh, the key into this, uh, represented in this uh, list of screens. And it, 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 also, it is also the model describing that screen with uh, some state data and so on. And as I mentioned earlier, this is what we write to the disk when we write your whole navigation stack and restore it later. It does make some things more complex. If you have a master detail view, you essentially have uh, two screens inside of a container screen, which is complicating things a little bit. Um, when we introduced bottom navigation in our app, that was a bit of a challenge. We, uh, Flow was never written with that in mind, and we had our own idea about how navigation history should behave with bottom navigation. So we have rewritten it or modified it to essentially have a separate history for each of the tabs. So we write that history, replace it with another when you switch tabs and so on. So you can have independent histories for each of the tabs represented in your bottom navigation bar. Uh, so anyway, this is how we try to solve things. And it turns out that others agree with us more or less. There are some other solutions that try to solve the same problem. You have Conductor, you have Simple Stack, and this year uh, we also saw Google introducing a navigation architecture component, which tries to solve the same problem in a slightly different way, but a lot of the philosophy is the same there. Now, 
another thing I want to talk to you about is our move from a monolith to modules. I talked about how we introduced the add input part of the app, or we saw that we needed to split split the app because we, well, we essentially uh, tried to reflect the organization structures uh, structure in our app. We had one team working with the add input stuff, and we had the rest of the app developers working on the rest of the app. We didn't want them to step on each other's toes. We wanted to enable them to work in different modules. As it turns out, organizational structure should probably not be reflected in code because organizations change uh, and we don't want to go in and refactor our app every time some team is given a new responsibility. But uh, once we did introduce the first module, it was simple for us to introduce more. Uh, we could start uh, splitting our app up into modules based on functionality. We saw build time, when the clean build time went up a little bit uh, with this change, but incremental build time went down because only a single module might need to be rebuilt when you changed some code. Now, Google is constantly improving build time with their build tools, so this might not no longer be the case, but that these were exp our, exp our experiences at the time. Uh, having a modular uh, app, it makes it more apparent for us which parts of the app are dependent on each other. And it forces us to think about what API is one part of the app exposing to the rest of the app. Uh, and seeing these dependencies and feeling them uh, makes it easier for us to enforce a smart structure and try to separate dependencies where possible. Uh, it can also makes it make it easier for us to replace parts of the app. So, for example, uh, we could switch all the code dependent uh, that that we used for messaging, for example. Uh, we could separate out all the tracking logic in a single module. Uh, and make a simple API for it, and we could then uh, swap out the actual tracking SDK used behind the scenes later on. It also makes it easier for us if we want to explore features like uh, Instant App, where you can surf a web page, you search for used bike, and Google will say, hey, there are uh, 5,000 used bikes on Finn. Click here to open the app and see the search results. It's easier for us to do that when we have split our app into modules. Uh, if we want to release parts of our app as standalone open source libraries, that's simpler to do because they live in their own part of the code base, and so on and so forth. Uh, an example of the modules that we are currently using is, as I mentioned, we have a messaging module. Image Loader is its own module. Uh, when we started working on uh, GDPR and consent, we uh, made that as a separate module. And we have all our styling uh, in a DNA module that contains fonts, colors, uh, commonly used drawables, and so on. Uh, and now for our next piece of wisdom. I guess you have all experienced the NIHS uh, phenomenon, where you start building an app and you might think that we are the only ones with the right mindset and the right philosophy to solve this problem in the best way possible. And of course, we have also fell victim to this. Uh, when we needed to do JSON deserialization, we wanted to make it as performant as possible. And Jackson, like JSON or Moshi and other similar libraries, was dependent on annotations. Uh, and we didn't trust Jackson to do this as fast as we could do it with explicit casting. So essentially, we used uh, all the cleverness in JSON. We said, well, we don't need you to convert this into ready-made uh, Java objects. Please give me a list of maps of maps of lists of strings and integers. And uh, this might have been a little bit faster uh, and uh, at early points of the app's development that mattered because uh, uh, devices were slower. Now, 
It also makes our code very hard to read, very easy to miscast something, uh, and using the annotations, well, you can still get errors where you think you're receiving a string, but you are actually getting an integer from, from the server, so on. But uh, at the very least, you can now read your code and see what happens. And you have type safety when you pass these responses further down the chain. When you get like four or five calls into a call chain and you see, OK, so I get this map of something. Uh, it's probably a map of lists, I don't know. And you have to look up your uh, JSON response and so on. So our lesson here was that it is OK to use clever features offered by others. Uh, magic can be good sometimes. We also had our fin image loader, contained around 600 lines of hard to read Rx Java code. It was very performant. It was very fast. It was thread safe. Uh, it didn't leak. It was completely impossible to read or maintain. And once the guy who wrote it left, we were helpless when we wanted to add new features. It was, also, it was also tightly coupled to a custom image view that contained some of the magic needed to make things work. But uh, we are not the first developers in the world that needed to load images. So at the end, we wrapped it all up in an API, replaced it with, uh, with Glide. If we want to switch to Picasso, for example, we can do that now very simply. We are slightly worse now at memory usage. Uh, we might have uh, slightly less efficient caching, but hey, Norwegians buy new phones every year. They can handle it. And now we can actually write code that we are able to read, maintain, and improve upon. So that's a bit about our lessons working with the app. So what's next? Where are we going from here? Well, we are, of course, looking at any shiny new technology that's coming up. We have looked at uh, Jetpack and the architecture components. Now, I mentioned navigation. It, try it tries to solve some of the problems that we are currently solving with Flow. We've looked at view model, uh, which, is, uh, which gives us a concept of life cycle aware uh, views uh, coupled with live data. You can now have state automatically saved and restored for views and so on. Um, we're not sure if we want to introduce a second architecture pattern. We already have MV MVP. We're not sure if we want to experiment with MVVM. We have done some experiments. It can probably be done, but we're not sure if it's good to mix approaches like that. We've looked at Room, which lets us very simply uh, serialize and deserialize classes to a database. But uh, it might seem that migrating our existing databases can be difficult. So we're not quite sure there. And these are all different solutions to problems that we are already solving. But there are advantages to switching. For example, navigation uh, has tooling in Android Studio. So we could visualize the uh, available navigation paths in our, uh, in our app in a completely different way. And it would might perhaps be easier to onboard new developers with common technology. Um, we're looking at instant apps, as I mentioned, where you could, uh, to the user at least, it seems like you are not installing an app. Of course, you are installing part of an app in the background and then displaying content in it. We are, have experimented a little bit with slices, where the app is given a small piece of real estate inside Google Search App or inside Google Assistant. Uh, it is definitely something that fits, that fits very well with what fin.no is doing. But uh, we'll see. For now, it's not even released by Google, so we're, but we probably want to be there when they do release it. We've seen an approach, or we've, we've seen a trend where we are introducing more components into, uh, into our app. Um, uh, Finn is part of Shipstead. Shipstead had, had an explicit strategy of convergence where we wanted to share components across, across our sites. So we had a messaging component that we integrated, which is used by several Shipstead companies. We have a trust and reputation, which is like user feedback and so on. 
uh, we have an authentication component that we introduced. But then, September this year, uh, these articles started popping up. So, whereas last year, uh, the obvious approach for world domination in Shipstead was to converge and share components, the way to world domination is now currently to split the company in two parts, where the parts that make the components we depend on will probably be a different company entirely. So the takeaway from this is that company reorgs do happen, and you need to gear your uh, team to be able to handle those changes. We want to move into open source more than we have. We are offering a couple of libraries. Our executivity response is for those of you that always wanted to wrap your permission uh, requests into RxJava. Capture Andro is our wrapper around the camera and gallery apps, so we make it easy for people to uh, upload, to pick an image for upload. There are other solutions to this, uh, but it serves us quite well right now. It might serve you as well. Uh, our flow, wh what we did with Squares Flow, it used to be a public repo, but uh, it became so tightly integrated with the wrap that it made sense to keep it inside the app code base. And we're working on what is currently known as Filter Kit. Uh, that's the name for our iOS implementation. We are working on an Android implementation. We want to make really beautiful, really awesome bottom sheet based filters for searches. And if this is something that you might need at some point, well, just wait and see what we can announce. Uh, it's not nearly done yet, but we want to uh, we want to put it out there and see if people need it, like it, and maybe can help us improve it. So, let's sum up. I have talked to you about our app architecture, pretty standard. Uh, the way we do single activity could be interesting to some. I've mentioned uh, a bit about what we learned along the way. Uh, if there is a takeaway, then it is what made sense before, might not make sense today. So reevaluate your choices every now and then and see if you can change what is holding you back. Uh, we've seen that we don't want to do the presentation logic in the back end. Uh, and don't be afraid of using libraries. And we are going to experiment with Google's Jetpack stuff. Uh, look at uh, integrating other third party dependencies more in our app, and we want to play around with open sourcing more of our app. And that's about it. Uh, if you have any experiences with some of the things that we are exploring, please come to the stand or here after the talk and talk to me about it. I would love to hear your uh, thoughts on it. So that's the end. Uh, I don't know if we have time for any questions. Number questions, yeah. yeah. Thank uh, you. Does anyone have any questions?